Well, good morning, everyone, officially, and let's get going with today's presentation. Um, a very interesting and full program, all about understanding dairy's new consumer culture. And it gives me great pleasure to be part of today's presentation. Um, I'm going to be doing lots of listening. I'm sure I'm going to be asking lots of uh, questions just to understand um, how we can actually improve our marketing activities to be able to adapt to consumer trends and nutritional insights and making sure that we're getting the right messages across uh, to an evolving audience. Um, and so we have today three speakers, um, Lauren Redders, Elsa Carpenter-Frank and Seasbert Mbebe. And I'm going to be introducing each one of them as we go through the presentation. Um, and so first up today is in fact Lauren Redders. Lauren, it's great to have you with us and we're looking forward to uh, seeing you and we're looking forward to you being our first presenter. Um, as Lauren's getting ready, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. She is an award-winning strategic planner at Fox P2. She's a senior strategist at Fox P2. Um, and she has over a decade of multifaceted brand strategy and integrated communication experience. And so today, Lauren's going to be sharing some of that experience with us and giving us some really good ideas as to how we can communicate with this particular sector of the market. Lauren, you happy with your slides coming through? So just in terms of the importance of segmentation, we all know that success looks like penetrating the right segments and knowing that you're penetrating the right segments. Um, it's about unlocking um, what motivates that segment. And then it's about acting on strategies that build brand loyalty through ongoing consumer engagement. So we all know that that's fairly simple in theory, but the segment part is often what trips us up a bit. And it's especially true when your segment is as elusive as the youth. So let's go through why we need to be focusing on the youth and why it's right for dairy. Well, just in terms of a couple of stats and, 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 and statistics, the youth is described as being aged between 14 to 35 years of age. And in South Africa, that equates to 34.6% of the population in 2020. So that's a huge portion of the population. It's a third. Um, but ultimately, what we also need to consider is the true power of this segment lies beyond just how many South Africans can be considered youth. The reality also comes down to influence. And 93% of parents are saying that their purchase decisions are shaped by their kids. So that's huge. And ultimately, we need to consider that the youth makes up 55% of consumer spending power in South Africa. So you can see why there's such a huge audience that we need to know and understand. And as manufacturers and marketers and brands, we need to understand what it's, what it's like to be young in today's day and age and to understand what's shaping their choices. So on the invite, you would have seen that uh, we mentioned millennials and Gen Zs. And for some of you, those terms may strike fear in you, purely because we've all seen the headlines. Whether it's that they're killing off the cereal industry today or the mall industry tomorrow, or that they're ditching diamonds, ultimately at the end of the day, we need to look at these audiences and why they seem to be killing off certain industries. In reality, they probably just need to be understood just a little bit better. Um, and by knowing how these generations tick and what makes them tick, we can get a little closer to persuading them in ways that fundamentally just make sense to them and the world around them. So we're going to look at why age cohorts are useful. And ultimately, at the end of the day, they're not the end all and be all, but generations are quite simply shaped by the context in which they emerged. So different, uh, different cohorts will develop different attitudes and beliefs, and that's caused by shared experiences in their early human socialization. So for Gen Z, they're, you know, in today's society, in South African society, they're called the born free. So they were born into a world of democracy. The baby boomers, on the other hand, are the people who were born after World War II. So you can start to see how those things factored into their reality and it shaped a lot of who they are. So ultimately, the, the psychologists had it right. We're all actually a product of our childhood. 
And ultimately, that influences the developments of our values, beliefs, our personalities, and ultimately our expectations, which often persist well into adulthood. So we really do need to understand what makes each generation different so that we can be brands and products that, re that relate to the context in which they find themselves in. So today what we wanted to do is just look at the difference between Gen Zs and millennials. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, Gen Zs are a whole new cohort. They're not just millennials 2.0. Um, they're their own cohort, they've got their own beliefs and their own systems. And as we said, this persists often into, into adulthood. And so let's try and understand what those differences are. In terms of millennials, the millennials are actually a little bit older than I think we all realize. This year, they would be aged between 24 and 39. Um, they're very tech savvy. The millennial perhaps wasn't born with technology, but it was something that they definitely like motivated, they definitely moved into. So they're very much about two screens at a time. It could be a laptop and a TV, it could be a phone and, and, and a TV, but they're, they're quite comfortable with two screens at a time. They communicate with text, they're content sharers, and ultimately they grew up in an economic boom. But when it came to entering the workforce, unfortunately, there was a recession that they went into. And ultimately that resulted in a lot of crushing student debt for these, these individuals. Um, and a little bit more about millennials, we might have heard that they demand instant gratification, but ultimately at the end of the day, millennials are also quite a tolerant generation when it comes to diversity and different thoughts um, and that kind of thing. When we start to look at Gen Zs, Gen Zs are actually, you know, they're, 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 the youngest that they are at the moment is about eight. Um, they're very much tech and eight. They were literally born with a screen in their hands, um, and that is why they're able to um, work with three to five screens at a time. And that's why omnichannel approaches for these audiences are actually the right way to go, because they can handle it, because it's part of their reality. They very much work with images and GIFs and texts because their world is so punchy and quick and on the go and that everything needs to be served quite quickly. They're very much about how can you show me something as opposed to telling me something with long, boring text. Uh, they are also the people, and you would have seen it through Cizwe's stuff as well, they're definitely the people who are creating their own content. They're not just about sharing it, they want to be the stars of their own world. And because they actually grew up in a recession, ultimately at the end of the day, they look for, they understand the importance of money and they, they're able to take care of their money and they're looking for free experiences. So when they can get snack-sized education or go to Google University for free, that's all good for these audiences. And as such, it's turning them into very entrepreneurial people who are driving the gig economy. Um, they wanna start their own businesses. They wanna be the stars of their own shows. And ultimately that makes them a great um, audience to look forward to in terms of what is the gig economy to them, what, are the, what is that entrepreneurial spirit that they can bring to the table. And I think the best thing about Generation Z is that they're the most accepting generation yet. They're very much all about being woke and all about being inclusive and we need to look at how we can also introduce those values into our brands and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's the difference between the two of them. And I think ultimately today, we also wanna take you through five trends that are just shaping their attitudes and what it could potentially mean for dairy. Um, so the first one is that they, revalue, they value relationships built on trust. So I think for millennials, it began with this idea of transparency and knowing what companies are doing and what they're saying and why they're saying it. And with Gen Z, the buzzword is now authenticity. In a nutshell, the youth of today are demanding that brands operate with purpose over profit. They want to know that brands align with their values. So ultimately, what does that mean for dairy? Well, the youth are concerned about what they're putting in their bodies, they're concerned about animal welfare, and they're concerned about environmental footprints. Their labels such as fair trade, ethically sourced, and low carbon impacts can all impact a purchase decision. So for dairy, this could definitely allow for a stronger focus on provenance, um, where and how products are produced, um, who are they manufactured by, what are their values, and what are their beliefs, and telling really rich stories um, around that. 
and making sure that people understand what your brand stands for so that when they're choosing you in a, in a supermarket environment, they're choosing you for a very good reason and a very good purpose. The second trend is that they're information savvy. We know that millennials were the digital pioneers, but Gen Zs are true digital natives. Either way, these audiences are turning to the internet for just about anything. We've gone from mom knows best to Google knows best. And purchase related information largely comes from the internet and social media now for these audiences. And this is actually often why the 93% of parents that I mentioned earlier um, are saying their kids are, are influencing their purchase decisions because they know that their kids are going to go look for reviews, look for videos, look for information, look for what their peers think are cool as well to help make an informed decision for the whole family. So once again, what could that mean for dairy? Well, you know, we need to also potentially answer the question of is dairy healthy and have it come from a credible source. The problem with the internet is that there's so much information and ultimately at the end of the day, it's about what's knowing, knowing what is true out there. So answering those burning questions like is dairy healthy, having an SEO approach around it, having an organic content approach around it so that those consumers know that they're getting the right answer from the right people. And as a category that relies so heavily on nutritional education, the internet is actually ultimately your best friend. The third trend is that they're demanding new and innovative experiences. So from something as new as interesting flavors, and as a millennial, I've decided to put wine flavored ice cream on the slide here, purely because that's something I would love to experience. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not just about new and interesting flavors. It could be packaging, technology, new formats that just make their lives easier. So the youth of today are looking for innovations that can either alleviate their daily pain points or potentially give them experiential currency. Now, what do we mean by experiential currency? Well, it's all about saying, how do we potentially move from pure product into an experience? And I'm going to use Starbucks as an example. Uh, this was called the Unicorn Frappuccino. It tapped into the zeitgeist at the time of all things unicorn. If you know anything about millennials and Gen Zs, it's that we love unicorns. Um, it was amazing in the fact that it, it was innovative, it changed colors, it changed flavors, it was only available for a short period of time. So there was this got to go get it now mentality to it. And best of all, it was totally Insta worthy. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Starbucks created this experience around this product that people then went to, to, to talk about on their own platforms. So talking about influence and how products actually speak to how people can start expressing themselves as individuals and start building on their own personalities is where it is at for Generation Z. So just on influence, we've already touched a little bit on influence and, and how it's so important for this audience. And influence is still a huge factor. I've ultimately put Kylie Jenner on here because I don't think that Kylie Jenner would be a multi-millionaire if, um, if it weren't for, for millennials and Gen Zs helping her get there through the platforms of Snapchat and Instagram. But ultimately, millennials are no strangers to those old school formats of influencers from the likes of celebrities. But what we're starting to see with Gen Zs now is that influence actually also comes directly from their peers. They just want to know that my friends are doing this or the real and authentic people in my life are also doing this. And so we also need to look at micro influencers going forward. So just looking at an example for dairy, I'm sure we all know the Got Milk campaign. Their campaign in the past relied heavily on celebrities um, and influencing consumers by leveraging those partnerships. But the new Got Milk campaign actually tapped into making milk cool again for a social first generation. And um, it involved TikTokers and it involved use, uh, YouTubers using milk in a really, really creative way. Gotta have it, eat it, want it, full of that nutritious milk, food for color, fragilistic, vitamin D, delicious milk, looking like this hack milk, love you, that's a fact milk, check out what you made, chocolate chip, hip, away milk, food, I hit the spot milk, question, got milk? <laughs> So what's amazing about this is that you could see that the brand pivoted. They said, 
you know, we're looking at influencers that are coming out of all parts of America. They're going out and they're buying milk. And this was happening amid the pandemic. They Americans literally went out and, and got milk. But it wasn't just that they were drinking more of it. They were finding fun and surprising ways to use it. And they were documenting it all on social media. Now, when you start to look at those micro influences at the end of the day, it's something as simple as uh, a milk recipe that all of a sudden trends and everybody's trying it on TikTok and tapping into the zeitgeist of that could easily make milk something that is a lot more relevant to these consumers' lives. The fifth and last trend is that they're open to exploring new ways of life. And I think that ultimately it comes down to that they're so connected to so much information, they're connected to trends, they're connected to social media and influences, and this global community community that our youth finds themselves in is actually so influential. So here are just a couple of examples of the um, food related documentaries that have come out on um, on Netflix recently, we know that the Game Changers was all about a vegan lifestyle specifically for your top athletes. And these documentaries are also starting to introduce people to new ways of living and starting to go, is what I'm doing the right way? Maybe I should try something else. They're really open to experimenting. And we also just need to consider that sometimes influence can come in from one of those celebs again. So when uh, Beyonce goes vegan, the whole Bay Hive goes vegan. And so we just need to consider this with the case of veganism and the rise of milk alternatives. Ultimately, at the end of the day, along with all the ladies' trains, we need to ensure that dairy remains relevant to the, year, uh, to the youth for years to come. Um, and making sure that we're tapping into the factors that could easily sway people and making sure that we're engaging with people positively. So the good news is within South Africa is that the veganism trend and the milk alternative trend is not huge in South Africa just yet, but it is something that we do need to consider. As we said, dairy within South Africa still has a part of the youth's consumption, as we can see from a couple of dairy brands that made it into the Next Gen's Coolest Brand Survey this year. Um, and as we said, there is, there is still stories that we can tell around this. But how do we make sure that we're keeping dairy in the hearts and minds and ultimately at the end of the day, making sure that we're making it into their baskets when they're a little bit older? We need to make sure that we're constantly relevant, that we're constantly present in their lives to make sure that when they're older one day, they still understand that milk is an amazing source of all sorts of nutrients and vitamins, and that it's, it can be a very important part of their diet. So we do know that from a functional point of view, the youth are becoming more interested in paying attention to labels, they're becoming more savvy about nutrition, and they're looking for calories that can nourish their bodies and minds. And so this is still a, a beautiful story for dairy to tell, and we know that it's a huge story for dairy to tell. But we also say, okay, within those strong fun functional benefits, what else can we talk about? Well, we can tap into that nutrition savviness and say to those consumers, how can we work on smarter snacking? I mean, we heard from Elsa earlier on that our, our competitors are largely things like chocolates and carbonated drinks. So how can we encourage these kids to actually be snacking on something that's so much better for them in terms of nutrition? We also know that within South Africa, dairy plays a huge role in child development, and there's so many opportunities on that side as well. So dairy still has strong stories to tell around its functional benefits. But on the other side of things, beyond this, dairy could maybe use a bit of an overhaul away from those functional benefits, or, or utilizing them in the right space in the funnel, for example, what I was mentioning earlier on with SEO, um, and potentially move into a place where we're looking at more emotional territories and what we can potentially tap into from there. So where to? Um, we, I'd mentioned earlier um, that the youth are looking for purpose over profits, um, and that might scare you. But ultimately, that is something that needs to go beyond just one consumer facing campaign, but be something that's rather baked into the DNA of your business and your brand. And I think that the idea can be summed up as simple as stand for nothing, 
and you'll fall for anything. And I think that one of the best ways to illustrate this is through an example, a real life example of Ben and Jerry's. I think we all know Ben and Jerry's in a way, but maybe what we don't know is that Ben and Jerry's have a long history of speaking out against social issues. Activism is quite literally built into their company values, and it gives them so much topical relevance when we start to look at the youth and creating brand love amongst the youth. So what they've done is they've taken that and they've put it into their social media strategy. So what you'll see from this slide is not one real functional benefit here, but what is amazing is that they've taken that, uh, that purpose of activism and they've activated it on their social media channels. And it all involves about talking about those heavy issues that we can see in the United States at the moment, but in a lighthearted and easy to understand manner. And Ben and Jerry's have, they've, they've gone from calls to defund the police to overhauling a country's asylum laws and even, even tackling systemic racism. But they have literally been a pace setter for purpose-driven brand behavior since 1978. So you can see that they have, they're not just now jumping onto the bandwagon. It's something that they've literally built into their company values and it's really paying dividends to the brand. So that is, of course, very much across the pond. Um, what are some of the tensions that we can tap into in South Africa? So our South African youth are dealing with a lot, like a lot, a lot. They're up against depressing unemployment rates, xenophobia, crashing debt, corruption that affects their lives and communities. And also being online so often also open, opens up their worlds, unfortunately, um, to cyberbullying and a whole host of other concerns. Cesar, we would have taken you through the social dilemma stuff. But ultimately, despite living in what can be described as unequal and hard times, our, our youths have, have actually formed really, really tenacious and resilient attitudes towards the problems that they're faced with. And this is amazing. And I think that as brands, we have a lot to, to talk about with this and to tap into the things that really, really matter for them. And how can we be more purposeful brands? And so ultimately, um, I'm gonna leave you with this one question to ask yourselves today. How can dairy brands move towards giving these audiences a higher sense of confidence to succeed in the world in which they find themselves in? And that's me. Hopefully the tech worked and hopefully you guys saw everything that I had to say and heard everything that I had to say. And I'm sure we've got some questions that you, you'll be asking all of us. Um, Elsa is a director at Let's Be Frank, a media consultancy. And uh, she graduated from UCT and then she decided to go into the field of advertising. And um, she has, uh, while she was doing her postgraduate advertising diploma, she realized that media was her passion. And she then has worked for a number of large agencies, including Ogilvy, uh, Barry Bush, BD, BBDO, uh, where she was a media director for nine years, Initiative Media, where she was managing director for 10 years. Um, she also spent five years working in the in magazine industry, where she worked as a publisher for Media 24 and for Touchline um, Media. And so she's been involved with several industry bodies, including the Cape Town chapter of media. And so we can't wait to hear Elsa all about TV. And should we still be looking at TV advertising for this particular generation? Over to you. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, so, yeah, for the Rediscover Dairy campaign, our primary meeting, me, me, medium is TV. And the question that gets asked a lot is, does TV still work? Um, and should we not be looking at other media? So in this section of the presentation, I'm going to take a look at the relevance of TV in South Africa and ask the question, is TV still relevant? And the short answer is yes. Um, and I'm going to take you through um, seven great reasons why TV works. Um, see, there's a slight delay on the slides. Are you seeing the seven great reasons TV works slide? We are all good, keep going. Okay, perfect. Okay, so before I get into the nitty gritty, um, there's just a couple of comments I have on the sources that I've used. Um, so even though the presentation about is about TV in South Africa, I will be referring to some international research. But then what I do is I equate it to what's happening in South Africa and see what's happening, you know, in the local market. Um, also a comment on our target market. Um, 
so this is when we come to planning TV, we have to have a very specific planning target market. And I referred to this in the presentation, so I'm just going to take you through the thoughts on this. Um, the Fox B2 strategy team identified teens as being um, the predominant target. Um, but since we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have an unlimited budget. Um, so it's key to prioritize a subsector of teens that will give us the best return on investment. And so we broke down the LSMs um, to, uh, which stands for Living Standards Measure, for those who don't know what that is. Um, and we broke those down into subgroups based in, in, um, on similarities in terms of media consumption. And it was very apparent that the largest group was LSM 6 to 8. Um, it's also a group that's very cheap to reach from a media point of view. Um, as soon as you add LSM 9 and 10 onto any um, um, media schedule, specifically on TV, but across all the um, all media, you're adding about 100% cost onto that particular schedule. So in this case, our target market is teens, LSM 6, 6 to 8. And a comment on what we mean by TV viewing. Uh, when we say TV viewing, that could be on any device. So it's watching TV on a TV set, cell phone, or a desktop, a desktop computer. Um, but as you see here, TV uh, viewing on a TV set is still very prevalent in South Africa. So the first of our great reasons, TV offers excellent reach. Um, so we're starting off with a slide from the UK actually um, to show that um, commercial TV is still the medium delivering the best reach. Um, it's also the medium that people spend the most time with. So even in a developed market such as the UK where people have access to multiple platforms, TV still, commercial TV still seems to dominate. What's the situation in South Africa? Looking at media consumption um, against total population, which is the green bar, and the two subsets of teens, we see that TV is huge. So 96 of teens say they have watched TV in the last day. Um, digital is an interesting one. 90% of LSM 9 and 10s have um, interacted with digital in the last day, and 84% of 6 and 8. Um, so that's a huge change from say two, three years ago where digital, digital wasn't actually performing that well in LSM 6 to 8. So we use digital as our support medium um, to target LSM 9 and 10 where we're not doing a good job on TV. Uh, well, we've chosen not to use TV for them um, and then we use uh, digital as well just to underpin the communications on, on um, television against LSM 6 to um, 8. Um, and they're also watching a fair amount of TV. As you see on this slide, over 60% say that they watch between two and six hours on an average day. Uh, we're seeing very similar figures on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, the second big reason for using TV is that it's very measurable and that's a very, very important thing for us. Um, so this is important, we need to know that the budget is being spent effectively and efficiently. So each time we plan a burst, um, we set targets in terms of audience ratings, reach and frequency. When the burst is complete, we then do a post campaign analysis where we look at how well we've done. Um, this is a very simplified example um, of a recent post campaign where we looked at the audience ratings we achieved versus those that we had planned. Um, and as you can see here, we did we did pretty well, which is great. But this was over lockdown, and we did actually see ma major increases in terms of TV viewing. So this is the audience ratings tracking we would do. Oops, uh, gosh, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so we. Um, so we look at audience ratings, uh, which we track immediately after a burst. Um, then we also look at reach of our target market and we look at average frequency. So those, those are the three main um, measures that we, that we look at. Then we also look at subgroups. So we look at moms, even though we don't target moms, moms are very um, heavy viewers of TV. So even though we're targeting teens, we actually generally get a, um, an additional 30% of ARs against moms. So we always do a very good job against moms. And then we also look at uh, ARs achieved by channel by income group. Um, and that's important because sometimes channels may not work as well for us as we thought. Um, and if any channel's not working, what we do is we investigate it and change our channel mix accordingly if necessary. Um, 
We also look at cumulative performance over time. Um, that's important to measure the entire campaign performance to see cumulative performance. Um, um, we'd have campaign target markets um, as well as burst target markets and we wouldn't want to be spending um, at a level where we may be getting diminishing returns on TV because that's just a waste of money. Um, third reason, our competitors are using TV. So Fox, the Fox B2 Strat team identified five, five main com competitive categories um, as being carbonated beverages, um, energy drinks, chocolates, chips and fast food. And as you can see on this graph, um, the spend over the last year has been predominantly on television. Um, so it's, if one can afford it, because not everyone can afford to advertise on TV, it's, an important, it's important to fight on the same battleground as your competitors. Another good reason, um, dairy. So we are doing this campaign essentially to support branded dairy advertising. Um, and to give a nutritional message. And since um, our job is to pr pr promote dairy as a category, it's good for us to be seen in tandem with the brands on the same, the dairy brands on the same platforms. And as you can see here, over the past three years, um, more than 80% of branded dairy advertising happens on television. Um, fourth reason, TV makes other media work a lot harder. Um, so this chart outlines the, this multiplier effect between ad channels and, effects, um, and the effects each channel can receive. And TV stands out as having the biggest and most consistent effect on the other channels. Of special interest to us in terms of this slide is the effect that um, TV has on digital channels since digital is our secondary medium. And we see here that TV boosts its performance by up to 31%. Um, Talking about TV and digital, it's interesting for us to see how many people watch TV and use the internet at the same time. Um, so this does this two screen approach, approach mean viewers are not properly engaged with the content that some, sometimes people have that concern. And, and on the contrary, actually, research by Nielsen says that 71% of viewers are using a second device to look up info related to what they're actually watching. Um, while 41% are texting or messaging about the show they are viewing. The fifth good reason is TV drives profit, something that all of us marketers are, are looking to, to, to um, achieve. Um, so we see in this uh, UK example again, the latest analysis shows that campaigns using TV are the ones that are most likely to drive a higher number of big business effects, such as high volumes of profit, market share growth and decreases in price sensitivity. Um, in this case, TV drove a 29% TV um, increase in uh, business effects, which is considerably higher than the next one, which was outdoor. Um, this slide summarizes the results of a, another study done in the UK to show um, the um, proportion of advertising generated profit cam in per medium. Um, so they, they looked at all measurable brands in the UK and in this chart we can see that TV generated 71% of total profit um, for brands, even though it only commanded 54% of the actual budget. And if we look at FMCG, um, obviously dairy falling into the FMCG category, we can see that this is even more marked. Um, so for FMCG brands, TV delivered 87% of total advertising generated profit. Um, over three years, which was a considerably higher than any of the other media types um, look, that they looked at. And then, of course, the big argument with the increase in terms of the number of platforms that people are, are engaging in, like Netflix, Showmax, etc., is are people still watching live broadcasts and TV channels? Um, so another um, example from the UK, when we look at TV viewing in totality and that we mean by live and recorded TV broadcast a video on demand and subscription video on demand, <clears throat> we can see that we're watching pretty much the same um, volume of TV as we were 10 years ago, but the way we're watching this has changed, although live TV is still predominant. But interesting when we look at youth um, that we see uh, slightly different pictures. picture. The trends are even more exaggerated here with the youth, uh, much more avid adopters of new forms of viewing, such as broadcaster video on demand and subscription video on demand. And this is obviously a concern for us since we are targeting the youth. Um, and obviously programs like um, platforms like Netflix and Showmax um, don't have advertising. 
However, it's interesting to note that, for example, Showmax now in South Africa have um, launched a new platform where they don't charge for viewing, but they do have advertising. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out um, in the long term. Looking at ways of viewing, um, my slide now is also, Oh, there we go. Um, so looking at South Africa, ways of viewing um, in the last week, we see that here again that live viewing is, is predominant, especially when you're looking at the LSM 6, six to 8 market, where recorded catch up and online is active, is mainly in the upper LSM, so LSM 9 and 10, so not necessarily our TV market. Uh, so fortunately, we're still seeing very um, a plenty of live viewing with almost 90% 96% of our market claiming to have watched live TV in the last week. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, you can see on the chart that the difference in differences in the way that LSM 6 to 8 and LSM 9 and 10 view, with LSM 9 and 10 showing a far higher percentage of recorded catch-up and online viewing than LSM 6 to 8. Um, so this is an interesting slide. TV viewing co company Digital Eye um, developed a technique for estimating Netflix viewership. Um, and what they did in this chart shows is they compared the Netflix um, data to British TV measurement data to see how they compare. Um, and out of all the programs on Netflix, the only one that came up in the top 20 was actually Friends. All the others were um, live broadcast programs that, that, that appeared in the top 20. Um, looking at South Africa, and this is an interesting slide here, how do we fare? Uh, this graph really illust illustrates how well live TV is doing in South Africa, specifically in relation to the LSM 6 to 8 market. It shows audience ratings against um, single viewing of the top programs currently on TV. So the way you read it is the top program in South Africa in terms of total population is Uzala, which is on SABC1. You see here that all the top programs are either on SABC1 or another SABC or ETV. So Uzala is the highest watched um, a program and that gives 27 AR audience ratings against our particular target market. What that means is that at any particular time that anyone's of our target market is watching Ozalo, we're reaching 27% of our target market just with one ad in Ozalo. So it's massive. Obviously the LSM 9 and 10 is much more fragmented. You're never going to get ARs that high against um, the LSM 9 and 10 market. And then this is an interesting slide um, from DSTV, um, and it shows how people with PVR and Explorer units view TV. <clears throat> and you can see the majority of households that have PVR capabilities are in LSM 9 and 10, yet we still see that li live viewing predominates, even though it's showing a decrease over time. Um, another interesting slide that shows the importance placed on live that the importance placed on live TV is actually increasing over time. So the, the question that was asked here is why do you watch TV programs live, um, i.e. at the time they broadcast rather than watching them later, i.e. recorded or via catch up or on demand? Um, and the biggest um, responses here was it feels like more of an event. Um, I look forward to programs to, so I watch them as soon as possible. And then I think big in terms of social media, um, to avoid spoilers or other people revealing the plot and to also so that I can discuss um, the program with other people. Um, so we can see that the, in a sense, the use of a second screen can actually encourage more live viewing since the second screen encourages spoilers and people want to get to the discussions immediately. Um, and interesting phenom phenomenon was lockdown. So what we saw was um, TV viewership increase significantly um, over lockdown, which is pretty obvious. People had a lot more time at home. They didn't have to sit in the car getting to work or tubes getting to work. Um, so they were viewing a lot more TV um, with their families and this gave rise to watching more um, new types of shows. Um, and 28, um, well, 8% um, said they strongly agree that they will carry on watching those kind of shows and 28% said they tended to agree. Um, so the repertoire, viewing repertoire has and will increase um, due to locks, due specifically to lockdown. 
Um, and finally, TV builds trust and brand fame. What I mean by brand fame is how well a brand is known. Um, so TV is, um, this is research done in the UK again, TV advertising is the most trusted, obviously hugely important for advertisers, um, trust being key. Um, TV advertising is also the most liked, um, also a huge advantage to any um, campaign. Uh, TV ads also the most, uh, most likely to encourage conversation, especially face-to-face -face conversations. And as we know, conversations about brands, hugely valuable. Um, so face-to-face, 53%, -face, um, followed by social media at only 14%. So TV ads definitely uh, the most talked about. TV ads also evoke emotion more than other media. TV, of course, has the advantage of being both visual and oral, and as such is able to deliver very much on the emotional platform. Um, an emotional response of a viewer has a very positive effect or influence on the attitude towards the ad and the brand. Um, TV advertising is also more likely to make you laugh. Um, humor is fundamental to um, forming positive relationships. We buy from people we like and humor is the easiest and the fastest way to get there. And then finally, fame and emotion generate the most sales. So research again in the UK shows that emotive and famous campaigns generate the largest business effects. And this was in the case, um, this was the case even in supposedly highly rational categories. So, um, yes, that's, um, so live viewing is on the decrease, um, as I've been through, but not to the extent that is sometimes thought. Um, it's also more, much more prevalent in the upper LSMs than the middle to lower LSMs. So while we continue to um, target the middle LSMs, TV is still very relevant for us um, and continues to be the most effective medium. And that's me, thank you very much. Thank you, Elsa. Uh, some very interesting information there. Yeah, thanks, thanks to Elsa as well. Um, you know, uh, social media is definitely not against TV. Um, obviously, it's taken a bit of um, attention away from TV, but the kids, the kids are involved with, with television, um, as Elsa also demonstrated. But the kids are also consuming stuff on their phones while they're watching TV. They're integrating uh, between all the different devices. Uh, I don't see the pop-up on my right um, that you guys can see my screen. No. Yet. Um, no, sis, where there's a delay on your there we go. as well. So there we go. All good. You're good to go. There we go. Um, <laughs> as I was saying, yeah, um, uh, uh, definitely social media is not, it's not against any traditional form. It's more, it's, it's adding to it. The kids are consuming it in a way that um, they're interacting between all the different devices um, and, and, and also communicating what they see on screen, what they see on their, on their laptop, what they see on their smartphone uh, and communicating with their friends. We call this um, the rise of um, ephemeral content. This is the reason I say this at the beginning is because as I go through the slides, you'll start to understand what I mean by ephemeral content. Ephemeral content is a big English word, big English word that obviously in South Africa we have 11 languages, but it basically means um, short, um, it lasts temporarily, it's not, it's not long content. So um, it's obviously built for social media, it's built for smartphones, it's built, it's built for all these different platforms. I'll take you through all the different platforms, what they're doing to, to take advantage um, of ephemeral content. Uh, it builds FOMO, um, it's accessible for a very brief, brief moment. The kids are swiping, scrolling, um, laughing, interacting, adding an emoji, commenting, and then they even forget it all afterwards. You know, uh, what they read eight seconds ago, they might even forget eight seconds later and they'll interact with something different. Uh, we, we have to understand this. In, with, with, um, with lockdown, there was the rise of Q and online Q&As, Insta live chats, Facebook live chats. Um, you know, the kids are all there. If it's an hour, it's too long. Uh, if it's 30 minutes, it's too long. The kids uh, jump on, they get excited. Oh, amazing chat, amazing chat. And then they log off, you know? So you, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot going on with these kids at the moment. Um, and we have, to, we have to better understand them, and better give them the content that they need uh, to take full advantage. Now, yeah, the social media landscape, um, I need to give you obviously a, a brief snapshot of what social media is looking like in South Africa. Um, of our complete population, 40% have access to social media. That includes WhatsApp, okay? Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people don't take, don't take WhatsApp 
as, as a social media platform, but it is because it's integrated with Facebook now, it's integrated with Instagram. Um, so you, whatever story that you can post on, on uh, or a status that you can post on WhatsApp, you can actually push through um, to, to, the, to the other different platforms, which is Facebook and Instagram. I'll share, I'll, I'll, I will show you how later on in the, in the slides. Um, and 75% 70, of that population that's on social media is age 13 and above, which means exactly our target market um, the early and I like I don't like to use the, the traditional term early adopters in the traditional term, but the, the teenagers are actually the early adopters of social media because they they communicate they know how to use the platforms much easier than we do. Um, who are these teens? It's extremely tech savvy kids, as I said earlier. They um, they inter they interact through all the different platforms at the same time. They could be watching TV, but they also on social media sharing with their friends what they're seeing on screen. Um, also at school, they're using tablets now as well. Um, they, it's easy for them to share this information. Uh, also, with that, uh, with that easy sharing com um, information means they also don't necessarily look at the detail of what they're sharing. You know, everything is happening so fast for them. There's also a little bit of danger, which I'll also explain, um, alert you on um, later on. How do we keep up with them? They don't want to feel stupid. You know, uh, they like to be respected. They like to be, they like to be acknowledged. They like to know that you understand them. Um, they roll their eyes as soon as they as soon as you lose them in those in the in those first eight seconds that they log on to your to your content. If you don't give them something interesting, if you don't acknowledge them, if they don't see themselves in your content, um, high chances that they they'll interact with the content are very very low. So we need to make sure um, they feel acknowledged. They they feel like you understand them within in your content. There's a, there's a massive trust issue um, that is also developed with that. As I said earlier, the dangers in the, in the quickness and the fast pace of sharing social media content, you know, uh, with the rise of fake news, you saw it was a phenomenon. Um, sometimes um, it's very difficult with, with the fast moving pace of social media to understand what is fake and what is real, you know, um, uh, but, but as, things, as things have developed, you know, it's it's easier for for brands to now if they acknowledge the kids, then the kids have a trust to the content that they see. But if you don't acknowledge them and you speak down to them, there's always a, a chance that they will look at it as either fake news. They won't trust it. They'll ask questions um, to make sure they get the detail. So you, we must make sure from the from the get go, we give the kids exactly what they what what they need, and they feel like they're part of that content, and we understand them. Um, the rise of fake news was really high in 2019, especially 2020 when we we're all on lockdown with the coronavirus um, at, at home. Uh, it was easy for people to just churn out all the content that they want. It didn't have to be real. It didn't have to be true. Uh, we Sometimes we found out a day later that it wasn't true, you know, uh, because everything was just so quickly and shareable, you know. But consumers have also realized this and they've realized the dangers. So they're now also hesitant in the content that they receive. You know, they ask the questions. So we need to make sure, as, as I said earlier, um, that we grab them within that first eight seconds. Now with that, with that came the rise of social media wellness. Social media, media wellness is really, really necessary. Um, I need everybody to really, um, really understand that it's really, really necessary. As much as it's nice to, for us brands to, to, give the, to give the content to the public as much as possible, if we send out a thousand posts, you know, it's really important that you understand the responsibility that comes with sharing um, content, you know, and how the kids use that content. We want our content to be shareable, but we also need to make sure that if that kid is sharing that content, they're not sharing something that will endanger the next person, you know, their peer, you know. Um, also, there's been movies on, on a very popular movie, The Social Dilemma, which is very close to us here in South Africa, that was on Netflix. To, um, was really, I, I advise anyone who hasn't seen it to watch it, just so that they can better understand the dangers that come with social media, even though it's fun, you know, um, but the responsibility that comes with sharing content on social media. Um, that has also woken up everybody, including the teens, that there is danger um, in, in social media, there's danger in content, there's danger, you can't trust every brand. Um, you can't trust every athlete or, or popular person out there with, with the content that they're sharing. And I thought it was very important for us to highlight um, a very popular um, day in, in the States, the National Day of Unplugging, uh, which, was, which started actually 10 years ago, before even social media was really as big as it is at the moment, you know, but 
around 2019 into 2020 was really the the real spike for them you know uh 3300 mentions uh which was very very much shocking to them because previously it was just another day another friday first friday in march every year for te for for nine years before that you know it's in the first week of march the first friday you know you uh, where people will uh, plug everything out from their mobile devices sometimes even television just so that they can they can interact personally with people and really understand the world that they're living in and take a step back and look at the world and say okay uh, i have a phone i've what am I doing with this? So maybe, maybe all of us now going forward, um, the next time we get into March, we'll we'll actually think different about about our responsibility in 2021 with our devices that we have and social media content that we're sharing. Now, with the, with, with 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 all that has come the rise of video content because what we see on TV is a full show of 30 minutes or 20 minutes or an or an hour or a full movie, but these short little clips that we share. Um, that are shared on social media, you know, which back in the day used to call trailers, you know, now the kids, they're taking snapshots during the show and sharing it and say, did you see that dialogue? I thought that that that, that section of the of the movie of the, or the show was really powerful. Sometimes even the shows themselves, they use the different platforms, which is YouTube, uh, Facebook, to share the content that was seen on, on live television, because they now totally understand that um, not all 20 minutes was really interesting for everybody. You know, how do we now segment what was what what that 20 minutes was to make sure that we fit the different platforms that it is? Because that's what social media is now. It's not about the massive big community that is the world. It's about the relevant communities that exist. So if you want to speak to, to, to skaters, give them exactly what they need in the short space of time that they need it in. Instead of giving them a whole spiel about skateboarding starting in, in in 1900 and whatever, and then getting to the to the to the crux of the conversation much later, you'd have lost them all. Give them exactly what they need right at the beginning. If someone is interested to continue, they can then go to the traditional platform and continue the conversation there. Also, um, uh, with the sharing of the information. Everybody wants to be a star. They want to be the first ones to share the, con the, the, the conversation. They want to be the ones um, to be known that they watched the premiere. They want to be the ones to know that they downloaded the song first. They want to be the one, the first to comment on, on, on everything out there. And also, um, they also want to be the, they want to now create their own platforms where they're sharing what they like with, the, with their peers and the people that are like them. You know, um, you've seen the different shows now with vlogs, uh, blogs, uh, people are talking and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm a sports fan and this is how I see things. And I'm sure there's a couple of people out there that I can engage with. It's not talking down. It's engaging that they can give me there from China. If a person thinks like me based in China, maybe we can interact on our YouTube channel and, and comment in the comment section or whatever. They, um, and this is where this is the world that the kids are living in. And we need to make sure our brands are in this space um, and obviously not disturbing them in what they're doing but sort of feeding the, 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 the information that they need to better enhance the conversation that they're already involved in. We must, we must always remember, we're not the ones telling the kids what to do. They're already doing it. How do we penetrate that and make sure we, we take advantage? Um, the challenge now for us is to also understand, yes, it's nice to share a video um, and think that it's really interesting for the kids, but we also have to understand um, uh, the length of the video is also important. So the features that exist on social media platforms are a version of a short video. Also, there's, plat there's, there's features within the same platforms for a longer version of a video. So we must, we must be smart in how we share the content with the kids and, and not give them a short version on a, on, a, on, a, on a platform where it's supposed to be long because they prepare themselves when they go to a platform like IGTV uh, for a long, a long video. They prepare themselves for a long video. Now, if you, if you share 10 second video, in a platform where it's supposed to be long, you, you, you might lose their trust and lose their support, you know? So we need to understand and be creative with that. Um, I've got two examples of a long version of a video from a campaign that we did for Dairy, which is the Dairy Dance Off, and also a short version of the video. I'll start with the longer version of the video. It's exactly the same campaign, just executed differently in a long version with the story behind it, um, this was one of our influences that we used. His name is Chad, based in PE. He's actually South African. You know, uh, this is the world that they live in. 
Okay, do me a favor. Back to hip-hop machine. What a man. What a boy. Another man. Another guy. We love the plan, mother. Oh, my mom, she's a love and love. Take me to the night. Very, very fun. Two for two for fun. Oh, my mom, she's a love and love. Take me to the night. Very, very fun. Two for two for fun. So that's the long version, as you can see, it's much longer. It tells the story of how Derry gave him go. He was tired during the lockdown, he was counting the days, you know, it was getting boring. He got he took a sip of his drinking yogurt, got some power, got his his parents who were also bored in a lockdown during lockdown, um, got them involved and they and, and they got their go from Derry into and they break broke into a dance off. That's the longer version. Now I'll show you a shorter version um inter uh, from one of our influences as well. He's in the cluster tip. <laughs> As you see, Titch didn't waste in no time. He was not interested in what was going on in the world, explaining what, what's going on in his life. He went straight to the point, boom, drank his dairy, got his go, boom, broke into a dance off. It, it, but it, 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 it sends this exact same message that we need. Um, you got the go. By drinking your drinking yogurt but the story was longer and very interesting obviously also from chad it wasn't exactly boring but the other the other teen same age chose a different part boom straight to the point in 10 seconds it was over you know and that's the, that's that's the current that's the that's the world that the, the, the kids are all living in with all of that came the rise of TikTok. took the world by storm um, was a phenomenal. All the kids got into it, especially teens. Um, it's a social media platform that you can add music features, you can add um, sound bites, you can add a voiceover, um, and practically create a, a new, fresh video um, based on this app without without needing to get out of the app. All those features exist within the, the same app. It's amazing, um, and the kids got got to it very quickly, and they really got excited, and it really spiked, um, especially especially in twenty between twenty nineteen and twenty um, and twenty twenty, uh, and it shook Facebook, which was the number is obviously the number one platform. After that is, is Instagram. Um, they got they 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 it got shook. They tried to to purchase TikTok because it was taking a big chunk of fun uh, that was happening on Facebook away from the platform, and it was all going to TikTok. Um, Fortunately for, for Facebook, um, with the rise of TikTok, there were then uh, concerns around privacy, um, around um, negative publicity that it was receiving in different parts of the world. And it, that, that negative publicity fed into, different, in, into all the different uh, other countries that maybe were the later adopters of TikTok, um, especially here in South Africa as well. It started to slow down. And the answer that Facebook got, they, they started to now use a, a, a new feature that they call reels on Instagram and make sure that the reels can be pushed through to Facebook as well so that you don't need to leave the platform itself. You stay within the platform that you were in and create exactly the same type of video content that you would have created on TikTok. Now you're staying in within Instagram and Facebook and, um, and, and it really started to really take a, a, a huge chunk back away from TikTok and, and, and the kids have really uh, grabbed it. But it doesn't mean that TikTok is, is all dangerous. Um, a, a, guy, a guy from Pretoria, a young kid, um, exactly what we spoke speaking about earlier, saying everybody wants to be a star and everybody's able to be a star on social media now. This kid does magic. I mean, when was the last time you heard that magic was cool? You know, um, he's, 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 a, he's 18 year old, based in Pretoria now, um, and he's, got, he's, the, he's the highest followed TikTok user in the whole of South Africa. He's not even on TV. He's not even on any show. He's not even a musician, maybe. Um, he's not popular for anything else besides magic in his neighborhood. But he started to share his content on TikTok and he's, he's got not over 9 million followers um, alone, you know, um, and doesn't need any other traditional platform to, to, to be this popular, which is, which is something really, there's something in it that, um, you know, these platforms are creating their own versions of stars that, that, um, that their peers like. And with that also feeds into the rise of influencers. Um, as I said earlier, Instagram's answer to TikTok was Reels, exactly the same platform, 
you know you can dance you can sing you can lip sync you can you can also imitate celebrity you can imitate your favorite scene within a movie uh, you know all those things exist within the platform you don't have to go download it from a movie the movies uh, the, the the creators the producers they all give reels and and tiktok all the content um so that the kids can, can take bits of bits and pieces of that content and create fun um interactive content where they feel like they're stars and can be celebrated by their peers uh, and i found that really really cool that that instagram and facebook were able to to answer that because there were real concerns around the, the security um of, of tiktok also stories you know i talked about fomo earlier you know um i'm at a party i take a photo i quickly post it on my stories everybody can see what i'm doing without getting into a long narrative narrative about oh i'm at this location um i'm with sarah and jane and we are eating popcorn um and we, we are at a party you know you don't really know how many people are at this party but it really does look fun doesn't it it makes you feel like you want to be part of this you know um you want to put your hand in that popcorn as well and laugh with 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 these kids you know and this is the, the type of content that they're creating we need to we need to make sure we engage them in those platforms with that type of content where we're also speaking about fomo we also want to want them to be part of the story we also want them to be part of the creation of the story um the creation of the story is the user generated content uh, it goes back to that first slide that i spoke to that i that i shared earlier the kids want to feel like they're part of this 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 ecosystem of, of content generation and content creation you know they don't want to be talked down on they want to feel acknowledged they want to see themselves in this content and sometimes showing them um that we like your comment and we share it we share it with the rest of the world later on um it does a lot of wonders for them you know um an example that we used on dairy was a dairy momento you know it speaks to ex um, your dairy moment in, in in a day you know when you're having your dairy please share with us um uh, that moment when you're having your dairy and we found it very interesting how diverse the content was you know and these were the two um finalists that we that we chose one was a birthday of of of, of a nine-year-old girl from from durban um the mom had just given birth to to a, a, a new baby boy they had a new member of the family and this is the way they celebrated using dairy um it celebrated the birthday on the other side uh was was a, a two two young kids um their mom is a content creator and she captures their moments um during the day how they consume dairy and this was one of the moments they they, they have their dairy with the cookies and this is standard stuff we know that the kids love having dairy dairy um with with cookies but it's nice that it's coming from them and not from us talking down on them saying drink your milk with cookies eat your cake with with drinking yogurt you know they are showing us how they consume and feeding us the information that we need to to create even more content that's relative and related relatable to them you know um and also acknowledge that our our consumers are, are this diverse um an example that that i got from the states um was from craft craft celebrating cheese they call it a cheese fest they created what they called a comfort zone right by collecting hashtags of people sharing how they consume cheese in in different forms um whether it's junk or you're doing it in a diet or it, it didn't matter at this time um but they were pushing obviously the junk side of things because that's what craft is pushing for um they wanted to see how consumers are consuming without going to grab the content they only follow tracked the hashtag and all gathered all that information in one space so if you're if you're a cheese lover you are able to go into the space and go and look and, and say oh i like that i'm going to try that today and, and you, you 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 try it you know um it didn't need craft to create all these recipes they were created by the people and they shared it in this one community and then the same community can go back there and say oh wow i didn't know you could consume cheese in that way and i thought that was really really cool and um, and, and these are the things we need to acknowledge that the guys want to create these little communities they don't want to do um what everybody else is doing they want to feel like okay you've acknowledged my community and 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 um i want to be part of your brand because you acknowledge my community so that's me um you know the takeaways here um the kids don't like all the noise they don't want they don't want to be feel like they're part of they're in a concert uh and and people are stepping are stepping all over them they want to feel like you acknowledge their community you acknowledge them 
as individuals, they also want to see themselves in your content. And the different various ways, we need to give them short content uh, that they can quickly get, um, get to the core of the message. Also, when we're giving them the long version of the content, let's make sure that within that long version, there's little points where we're making sure they're keeping up with the whole story. Um, also, the other end of it, let's let them create. Let's let them give us the content. Let's let them, uh, let's allow them to show us the way because we don't know everything clearly. Um, they know what, how, the, how to consume uh, uh, the content on, on the different platforms. So let's listen to them and also, uh, and also show them that we understand exactly what they were telling us. That's me. I hope you enjoyed. Um, if anyone wants to wants... and let's chat some more. Thank you, Cizre. Some very useful insights and uh, very interesting to see how creative people are in uh, just coming up with the, you know, advertising campaign that you don't even have to pay for. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a niche. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how, how, how we handle that whole situation, but, but very, very, very interesting to see how creative people actually are. So thank you so much.